What if bombers in the Second World War had stopped carrying air gunners in their crews? Would this have saved lives? Air gunners lost in operations made up about 36% of all bomber command aircrew killed. For the 8th Air Force, this represented about 41%. So by removing as many as two men from British crews and perhaps even five men from American crews, could the Allies have really saved lives? Now, this isn't some post-war revisionist theory. It was a genuine wartime suggestion that came out of the British Operational Research Section. These civilian scientific advisers really believed that removing gun turrets from British aircraft, at the very least, would improve the bomber loss rate, as well as reducing casualties. So why wasn't this theory ever tested? Well, one of the reasons given was that those civvy street boffins were too afraid to tell Arthur Harris about it. So as ever, there's a lot to unpack here. I hadn't come across this proposal before, but while reading the autobiography of Frank Musgrove, who flew as a Lancaster navigator with number 149 Squadron, he raised a heck of a lot of interesting points. One being the idea that the upper, rear and front gun turrets on British heavy bombers should have been ripped out and the air gunners benched for the duration. It was not Pilot Officer Musgrove's own idea, but as a member of the academic community post-war, he did have some compelling ideas in his book, so I'd highly recommend it for your own book wish list. The idea originated in the Operational Research section. This organisation was the brainchild of Professor Patrick Blacker, who worked predominantly with the Royal Navy and Coastal Command during the war. Similar organisations were set up in the RAF, including Bomber Command. The idea was to give these military organisations the benefit of the technical knowledge of civilian consultants and therefore improve the efficiency of their own operations. Blackett was by all reports a force of nature and successfully influenced the senior service. His counterpart in Bomber Command, Dr Basil Dickens, has officially been recognised as being cut from the same cloth. His appointment to head the BCORS was seen as significant by official historians and he was described as brilliant by Arthur Harris, though also as young. He was just 33 when he took up the role. Contrary to this praise, he was described as a spineless sycophant by some of his subordinates. But a very spineless character. He never would say anything to Sir Arthur Harris that Sir Arthur Harris didn't want to hear. And this is an appraisal that would fit with Sir Max Hastings' evaluation of Bomber Command's HQ at the time. However, to say that Bomber Command and Arthur Harris in particular were intransient in their prosecution of the bombing war might be a little unjust. True, Harris didn't suffer panacea merchants gladly, but evidently supported any technology that would improve the effectiveness of his bombers. The introduction of navigational aids such as oboe, H2S and the like would support this evaluation. There's also the fact that when Harris was CO of 5 Group, he proactively updated the gun mounts on his Hamdens by hiring the firm of Alfred Rose and Sons to invent a better solution. He did this by successfully sidestepping the official channels and then ordering so many units that the Air Ministry was obliged to pay for it all. Genius. All this to say, Arthur Harris was not opposed to taking drastic action to improve the chances of his crew's survival. But of course, he was at the mercy of red tape on many other topics of safety. Think escape hatches and 50 cows. That being said, there did seem to be a glaring breakdown in the system, according to Freeman Dyson, a theoretical physicist and mathematician who was then a 19-year-old advisor in the ORS. If Dickens didn't think Harris would want to hear something, he would alter the results of a study, or worse, not pass it on at all. This seems hardly conducive to an open and effective conversation on how to improve the effectiveness of Bomber Command while reducing the possibility of death for thousands of young men. I think is a point often forgotten in the condemnation of Harris post-war. And so it was in this atmosphere that Dyson and his colleagues came up with the idea of removing gun turrets from British bombers entirely. The theory was based on research Dyson carried out after joining the ORS in July 1943. Previous studies had shown that a crew's chances of surviving a tour of duty significantly increased as their own experience grew. 
This enabled commanders to confidently tell the young men under their charge that if they could get 10 or 12 ops under their belts, their chances of making it through the war were much higher. Most Sprog crews seemed to go down before this milestone was met, and the findings were logical. The better the crew were at their jobs, the better they were at avoiding unknowable dangers faced by greener crews. It must have been good for morale, at the very least. The problem was that when Freeman Dyson carried out his own study, he found no connection between level of experience and mission survival rates. Something was happening over the skies of Germany that was indiscriminately claiming the lives of very experienced crews and sprog crews alike. The chances of coming back seemed to no longer rely on how many times you'd been on ops. Post-war, the answer was confirmed, but working out of their little caravan offices in the woods around High Wycombe, the team of ORS-2, and in particular ORS-2D, were completely in the dark. Well, not completely. The head of ORS-2, Reuben Smead, met almost weekly with an invader who'd been shot down over Europe and made it back to Blighty. When asked how they had been shot down, most could only tell him that they had suddenly been attacked, and before they knew what was happening, they were bailing out. No one seemed to have drawn the correct conclusion from these interviews, other than experience, apparently, could not prevent the cause of these losses. So it was proposed that as every crew had exactly the same chances of being lost on an operation, the easiest way to reduce casualties was to reduce the size of the crew. By leaving the gunners behind, that was at least two men on heavy bombers who didn't need to die. Also, by removing the turrets on the bombers and making them more aerodynamic, their performance could be improved. ORS claimed that as much as 50 miles per hour could be gained in speed, which would greatly improve a bomber's chance of evading the night fighters, the main cause of the nightly losses. This all seems logical and worth testing, so why were no trials carried out? According to Freeman Dyson, it was simply because Basil Dickens didn't have the guts to tell Bert about the scheme. My question is, was Dickens right? Was it a stupid idea? When you really sit down and think about it, the role of an air gunner is not what it seems. While it is true that during the Great War, they were a deadly adversary, this became less and less true during the Second World War. The key difference was that, especially in the case of the Allies facing German fighters, they were no longer using the same armament as the foe. Machine guns, even the heavier calibre ones used by American crews, were being outmatched by the cannon armament on fighters. British aircraft, especially the fairy battles of the advanced air striking force, found that their air gunners could not effectively defend them. At best, they could distract incoming fighters if using tracer, or give advance warning to their pilots to take evasive action. There is an argument that says this ability could have been replaced by technology. Monica, a radar warning system that could do just that, was developed in June 1942. It gave the crew an indication of whether or not another aircraft was behind them and at what distance. This was done via a high-pitched tone blasted out over the intercom, which became more rapid the closer an aircraft became. As Freeman Dyson explained, crews found it bloody annoying. It was too sensitive, which made it unreliable, and most crews simply turned the thing off. This probably saved their lives, seeing that the Luftwaffe had developed a method to hone in on bombers using the system. When trying to determine the effectiveness of Monica on crew survival, Dyson mathematically concluded that it made no difference at all. By late 1944, it had been abandoned. It would seem that no air force during the Second World War could rely on only their gunners to defend their bombers. The Luftwaffe discovered this in the summer of 1940 when they attempted daylight bombing. The 8th Air Force rediscovered it three years later. RF Bomber Command was taught the same lesson in 1939. While fighter pilots were still at risk when attacking an enemy bomber, whether alone or in formation, a determined attack would usually see the bomber being shot down rather than the fighter. There are, of course, some fantastic reports of bomber crews bucking the trend, but these were isolated cases. So, did the air gunner serve any useful purpose aboard a bomber aircraft? Without a doubt. While gunners could and did shoot down enemy fighters, their most important task was observation. Ironically, the very metier that began their role in 1914. 
The gunner was the eyes in the back of the pilot's head. During daylight, while flying in formation, gunners could warn of impending collisions or the progress of the rest of the flight behind. At night, it was the air gunner who might spot a stalking night fighter and give the life-saving command, corkscrew to pull, go. Gunners were also available to carry out important tasks such as giving first aid to other injured crew members or fighting cabin fires to save a crippled aircraft and sometimes being awarded the VC for their trouble. Their other main role was to provide a deterrent to approaching enemy aircraft. Even though the advantage was invariably in the favour of the attacking fighter, it takes extreme nerve not to break off an attack when tracer bullets are curving up to meet you. In fact, enemy fighters were forced to attempt difficult attack angles in order to minimise their exposure to return fire. This brings me back to the memoir Frank Musgrave wrote. In it, he describes a catastrophic daylight mission he flew on the 12th of December 1944 to Witten. The force of 140 Lancasters was intercepted by German fighters, with the then Flight Sergeant Musgrove's squadron being attacked by FW-190s. Eight Lancasters were shot down without a single loss to the Luftwaffe. Musgrove recalls the following incident during the mission. There's a fucker wolf on our tail, Skipper, the rear gunner's flat and unhurried Lancashire voice. He hasn't opened fire. I'm not going to fire either. He might fire back. Apparently this fighter followed Musgrove's Lancaster for nearly 10 minutes while the rear gunner determinedly stuck to the policy of don't fire first. This was the result of another ORS study that showed aggressive gunners caused more damage to their own side, as well as encouraging more attention from the enemy. The simple fact for the British for much of the war was that their defensive armament was far inferior to the offensive armament of the Luftwaffe. So, if these members of crew had been removed, would it have led to more or less bombers being lost on operations? Specifically, when talking about British and Commonwealth or American bomber crews, we have to make the distinction between daylight and night bombing. We also have to think about the way the various air forces flew their missions. The air gunner was a key component of the pre-1944 American approach to aerial bombing. It would have been impossible without men manning the guns of the B-17s and B-24s. Could American air gunners have been left behind on certain missions or in certain phases of the war? It's a possibility. Air operations on D-Day would have called for very little defensive capabilities for American bombers, but having extra eyes in those busy skies was probably an advantage. Of course, it was only after the operation that the commanders learned of the Luftwaffe's absence. I'm going to go out on a limb here and say I don't think the American approach to bombing would have worked without air gunners, even when long-range escorts arrived en masse in 1944. While the individual gunner, especially those with a single 50 cal, may not have posed a great threat, the combat box had its merits. For the RAF, defensive armament was almost redundant during daylight missions, except as a deterrent. The RAF, post-1941, never really developed the tight formation of the American combat box. Even when Frank Musgrove was sent to Witten during the daylight hours of the 12th of December 1944, the Lancasters didn't fly wingtip to wingtip. They adopted a loose formation to keep themselves generally in the same part of the sky, but no closer. No doubt this is why the 190s cut through them so effectively. At night, however, I would argue that air gunners, whether actually armed or not, were an advantage. Given the very high density of the bomber stream in 1944-1945, making yourself a tough prey would surely encourage a night fighter to break off and find easier meat. Even with the effective development of onboard radar and the improved German Nachtjäger force as a whole, if an RAF crew could spot a prowling fighter and corkscrew away, they would more than likely shake them off. But answering just how likely that was is quite difficult. Ken Delve, in his book Night Fighter, gives the example of an attack on Leipzig flown on the night of the 19th to 20th February 1944. The Luftwaffe flew 294 sorties that night with an interception rate of 28%. Of those 82 contacts that were tracked, 74 were shot down by German night fighters. That's a 90% success rate. 
Whether this was the norm is hard for me to say, but what is clear is that the Luftwaffe was able to achieve this by the beginning of 1944. We could assume that the eight RAF bombers that escaped that night did so because an air gunner spotted the approaching fighter. However, the reality is that given the tactics employed by the Germans, it's more likely that they messed up these interceptions themselves. Although Freeman Dyson claimed that Bomber Command had no idea of the effectiveness of the German upward firing guns, many crews reportedly did carry out constant manoeuvres to check their blind spot below. Was this practice in all squadrons? Probably not. The reality though was that RF crews really needed an additional ventral gunner to keep them safe. But despite the ORS research, the anomaly that led to any type of crew failing to return had not discovered the attacks from below that night fighters were using to devastating effect. When it comes to the proposal to remove air gunners, there is one other observation to make, something Freeman Dyson probably didn't consider, but this isn't necessarily his fault. The simple fact is Dyson, a civilian, was not granted intimate access to the crews whose lives he was trying to save. In his book, Disturbing the Universe, he brings up a very interesting story. He describes how Wing Commander McGowan, the chief medical officer at Whiten Air Base, flew on several missions with the crews he cared for. Having completed nearly a third of a tour, not only boosted the morale of his charges, McGowan was a lucky charm for the crews he flew with as he always came back. It also gave McGowan the moral authority to stamp LMF on the files of those boys who cracked up. Dyson was not given this insider's view of the problem. Therefore, he never really got the vital insights into aerial combat that he needed to make a more informed conclusion. Firstly, why did the Germans develop their now infamous Schreger Musik? It was simply because attacking in the usual way from the rear did not work because the air gunner was there to spot you. Remove that gunner and the far easier method of attack from dead astern was now possible. It would not have taken the Germans long to deduce that the wreckage of enemy bombers no longer carried gun turrets. Also, and perhaps more importantly, having your tail end Charlie sitting in the cold and exposed rear of the aircraft boosted the morale of the other men. They knew that there was a good chance their mate would see the one seeking their death and give advance warning of it. However, it has to be said that these men, these boys, probably would have flown without the protection of gunners if ordered to do so. Their collective bravery was remarkable and their determination to finish the job, no matter what, was evident. So was it worth taking the risk? Dyson and his colleagues would argue that by removing the drag-inducing turrets and the added weight of these positions and their men would boost the aircraft's performance. Obviously, the best way to have tested this would have been in a real-life trial. Today, the best way I can think to evaluate this claim without any advanced degree in aerospace engineering is to look at the Avro Lancastrian. This was the civilian version of the Avro Lancaster, which indeed had all the gun turrets removed and replaced with more aerodynamic features. Was the Lancastrian roughly 50 miles per hour faster than the Lancaster under the same conditions and loading? Would this have made much difference against night fighters? Now, before we get into the numbers here, I have to admit I'm not entirely happy with the data I've been able to collect. While I've managed to find some genuine flight tests carried out in the Lancaster that I trust, I had to rely on Wikipedia for data for the Avro Lancastrian. Here's hoping one of the references they used actually had access to a manual or two. That being said, I think it's still worth looking at the numbers. The tests carried out on the Lancaster Mark I and Lancaster Mark III, which were the two most produced variants, give the level of performance in true airspeed. I've given you the results of the tests for the MS and FS supercharged gear settings. It's also worth noting that the test for the Mark I was carried out with a test rate of £45,300 and the Mark III at £58,600, a difference of £13,300. And Wikipedia was able to provide the following performance data for the Lancastrian, which was apparently tested at £65,000. For reference, let's look quickly at how much those gun turrets weighed. 
fully crewed up and armed, those three turrets on the average Mark I Lancaster weighed in at 3,488 pounds or one and a half tons. The Mark III was fitted with a different upper turret, but we can use this as a rough guide. To put that in context, that's the same as about half a B-17's normal bomb load and one fifth of the total weight of fuel a Lancaster could carry. So removing them and two of the men needed to man the upper and the rear turrets would result in a sizable decrease in the aircraft's weight. In reality, the front turret could have been removed in most cases anyway, as the bomb aimer rarely had the chance to use it, according to many sources. Looking at the performance figures for the Lancaster and Lancastrian again, you notice that the Mark III tests were performed on an aircraft weighing 58,600 pounds with the all-up weights noted at 63,000 pounds. Wikipedia claims the level performance it quotes was on a Lancastrian weighing 65,000 pounds. So despite being heavier, and without the drag-inducing turrets, the aircraft could achieve a faster true airspeed at comparable altitudes to the Lancaster. And if we believe these figures for the Lancastrian, then it may very well have performed favourably in the face of German night fighters. Given the fact that these crews had to stalk British bombers in the dark, higher cruising speeds for the latter would have used up more of the German fuel reserves in pursuit of them, leading to shorter and shorter sorties. This would more than certainly reduce the number of interceptions and therefore may have reduced RAF casualties. Perhaps this does in fact support what the chaps in ORS-2D were saying. What do you think? But of course, there are still other areas to explore. The best argument for bombers without gunners is the de Havilland Mosquito. There's an entire debate to have over why Bomber Command didn't simply employ the Mosquito as its main bomber. I'd really like to get into that in a video dedicated to just this topic, but let's look into just a few points here. Firstly, it has to be said that the Mosquito was in fact used to carry out raids on targets, which had previously resulted in unsustainable losses to the main bomber force. For example, the Battle of Berlin, waged between November 1943 and March 1944. Over the entire period, the average loss rate was 3.8%, which translates to 1,117 aircraft of 29,449 sorties lost. However, many individual raids during the period, especially those on the German capital itself, were far in excess of this. On the night of the 2nd to 3rd of December 1943, for example, 8.7% of the 458 aircraft attacking Berlin were lost. Compare this to raids carried out by mosquitoes alone, you get a very different story. Ten days later, on the night of the 13th of December 1943, 16 mosquitoes attacked Dusseldorf with no losses. Also on the 26th and 27th of March 1945, 80 mosquitoes attacked Berlin for no losses. These admittedly cherry-picked examples show that it was possible to carry out bombing raids in unarmed aircraft without casualties. This is why mosquitoes were increasingly used by Bomber Command to carry out nuisance raids over the German capital rather than risking the main bomber force. Despite the advantages of using this swift twin-engine aircraft, the fact remains that at its extreme range, the mosquito's bomb load was a fraction of the heavies. To achieve the same level of destruction would have required at the very least three mosquitoes for every Lancaster, possibly more with longer range targets. This is even if you factor in the assumption that a mosquito force would be more accurate in its bombing. There's also the financial burden. Even if lives could be saved, it would be hard for any nation to stop using expensive bombers they'd built or expensively trained crews without carrying out the detailed studies on the theory. As we've seen, Basil Dickens was not one to bring radical ideas to the desk of Arthur Harris, so this seems unlikely. As I said, I'd like to dedicate a lot more time to research this, but I know that many of you will have been thinking about the Mosquito while we discuss this topic. So what do you think about the operational research section theory? Could bombers have been operated by the RAF or any nation without air gunners? Please let me know your thoughts and any points I've missed in the comments section. And if you're interested in another interesting theory about Bomber Command, check out the video on screen now.